Has anyone else experienced seeing a tall, cloaked type of shadow figure? No face, just darkness. The first time I saw this, I was in first grade. I awoke from a nightmare to see it in my hallway, about 10 feet away from me, just watching me. I didn't see it again until I was in seventh grade. At this point, I started having demonic nightmares again for a couple of days. And when I was laying down to go to sleep one night, I felt something touch my arm. My mom let me sleep with my dog because I was terrified and my dog started barking at the end of my bed and refused to sleep in my room. The next night, I woke up from a nightmare to this thing at the end of my bed towering over me. I was able to move and I was very aware of its presence. I felt like I was drowning in fear, like I was in the presence of evil. I'm almost 22 now and I haven't seen it since. The only other thing that has occurred is when I came out of my shower recently I found Leave Now on my mirror. It wasn't written by finger, but it was quite literally formed from water droplets. The door was locked, and I would have seen if someone came in. It wasn't from a past message written on the mirror. I cleaned my mirror regularly. I wiped it away and was going to pretend like I didn't see it. But the more I thought about it, the more I've just been reliving things from my childhood. And I've honestly freaked myself out. My mom is the only other person that experienced something similar in my family. She experienced this once in her life, and it was quite similar to what I experienced. I moved into my apartment about a year ago. My previous home was pretty active. I.e., we heard a train go through our backyard in the middle of the night. Guests would report people moving around in our room when we weren't home. And my wife coming home to all the lights on after she turned them all off. The timing for my apartment being available was odd but convenient. I'd always had an urge to ask the property management company if someone had died in my apartment but never did. There have been a few times when I feel like I'm not alone but I'm not in danger. There have been three instances where something was making a direct attempt to interact with me. One, I was woken up in the middle of the night and something was clearly in the corner of the room with ill intent. It watched for a moment and wouldn't go away until I'd recited the Lord's Prayer a few times. I haven't felt that one since. A friend was coming over for dinner and I leave my door unlocked when they do. I always want my friends to feel comfortable just coming in. I was getting out of the shower, getting dried off and dressed, and heard my friend said, Hey, I'm here. I called back, I'll be right out. I go to the kitchen expecting my friend, and they aren't there. Not even five minutes later, my friend comes walking in. I asked if she'd been playing with me, and she had no idea what I was talking about. Three. I was asleep one night, not comfortably resting. I think I was having a bad dream. Something on my mind was keeping me in a shallow sleep. If I remember the dream correctly, something felt impending. Clear as day, I hear my mother shout my name in the tone she used when she was trying to get my attention urgently. My mother has been gone since 2018. I'd spoken to a few spiritual friends and they tell me the thing is trying to contact me and I should ask what it wants. I'm reluctant to do that because I know once you go communicating with things like that, you're holding the door open for trouble. So I guess my question is, does this sound familiar to anyone? Should I be more alarmed? I am not sensitive, clairvoyant, perhaps a little on the empathetic side. There have been times where I've been able to communicate with other consciousnesses during shallow sleep cycles. The other night, I'm at my girlfriend's house. She's a light sleeper, and my CPAP needed surface, so my snoring was keeping her up. She had to work, and I didn't, so I went to sleep on the pull-out couch. I can't fall completely asleep, drifting in and out of consciousness. At one point, during a semi-lucid dream, an inanimate object breaks and a voice says, not safe, then nothing else. I wake up completely and have the unnerving realisation that someone is staring at me from near the window, but still in the room. The someone was heavy. The floorboards creaked underneath them. There were no footsteps and no sounds of my girlfriend up and moving. 
My go-to in times of spiritual uncertainty is to recite the Lord's Prayer. And eventually, the presence leaves. I'm up for the rest of the night. Some context to the house. My girlfriend is a widow, and her husband died in the house. I've never encountered any jealousy vibes or animosity, but it's important to note. My girlfriend says that when she was young, she would always, always see a shadow creature stand at the edge of her bed and stare at her for the entire night. They went away after she moved out into her own place, but doesn't like staying in the house when she's by herself. The home is blessed by an Orthodox priest every year. Does any of this sound familiar to anyone else? Was I in danger? Are there any precautions I can take to keep it from attaching to me? So this is 2010. I'm 20. I'm from India, and that day I was coming back from a religious ceremony at a friend's house. I was sober as always. No drinks, nothing. But I used to smoke back then. I had a pack of cigarettes too. Two of my friends were returning too, who lived a little far away from my home. All three of us came to there on a motorcycle, and then they went home and I walked alone to my home. It was around five past twelve at night. When walking towards my home, I see someone who is far and is walking towards me. I keep walking. But as the distance between us was reducing, the view became strange. I couldn't figure out what that thing was. I felt a bit scared, but also curious, so I kept walking. And when it was really close, it felt like a woman carrying a kid in her arms, and I was hearing a dog crying. The voice was coming from her side. It's like the kid was crying in her arms and the dog's voice, but the image was still unclear. It was a few meters away, and I thought of facing the thing and fighting it. But suddenly, I felt like she opened her arms and nothing dropped, and she placed towards me. My patience just ran out, and my heart started pouring and made a dash to my home in the shortest time ever. I have no memory of what happened after I came home and went to my room, but my parents told me I was roaming around smoking in the house, shouting strange things, and that they were scared for me. And then, suddenly, I left home. They followed me for a while, but I outran them. That's all they know, and next day, I woke up in a temple where we worship him. Since my childhood, I've been a devotee. I have no clue how I reached the temple, what happened to me, but I woke up at the feet of the Hanuman statue. In the temple I came home, and that thing never happened again. In fact, I became mentally strong, and I never have I feared that again. But that night was something. I had that thing, had got its hands upon me. I don't think I'd be normal today. I tried to find out what that thing was. I heard stories from many people. I even met one victim of that thing. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say the thing becomes active in September and whoever gets its hands upon loses its mental balance. The victim I saw has been kept in chains because it becomes violent any time. My relationship was starting to get on the rocks, so I did the thing anyone would. I took my girlfriend for a romantic cave walkthrough. Alright, don't judge me. I'm sure I had a good reason why I decided to take her to an old abandoned mine. In fact, I was going to the old abandoned mine. The date was set, and the ring safely tucked away in my pocket. The last section of the mine has a type of rock that glitters in dim light. I figured it would be a good place to do the deed even though a romantic dinner might have been a better idea. The first sign of trouble was two of our mutual friends came along making it a double date. That's fine. I could deal with it. I could easily drop hints to get them out of the way before I got down on one knee. When we arrived, Tabby and Jason were waiting for us out front. We needed to do a small hike to get to the entrance, and Leia was already in a mood. Her shoes and massive purse were not meant for a hike or walking around an old mine. She refused to leave her purse in a car and claimed she didn't have any other shoes. I gave our friends a wave when I saw them and walked over to them. We stood chatting for a bit and getting caught up on each other's lives while standing outside the old mine's entrance. When Leia was off taking a smoke break, I got in close to whisper to my friends about the plan. Could you guys, like, give us a few minutes alone when we reach the dead end with all the nice rocks? I need to ask Leia something. 
I told them, hoping my hint got through. Oh, Jamie, Tabby started and shut up real fast. From her tone, she almost sounded sad. Maybe she wanted to get married first. No problem, we'll leave you to it, Jason butted in. With everything planned out, we were all set out to go inside the cave. Leia joined us as soon, and we were all walking along chatting. But Leia kept a bit silent, checking her phone pretty often, even though I doubted she had signal. I was nervous as hell, more than I'd ever been in my entire life, and prayed I was acting natural. Oh, I forgot uh, my water bottle in the car, Tabby said suddenly. So much for acting natural. Jason nervously nodded and took a hand. I'll help you go back and look for it. Without giving us a chance to answer, they both ducked out of the cave, leaving us alone sooner than I thought. Let's hurry up so I can get home before I miss my show, Leia told me, to take the lead. We could always stream it later. That was not the right answer. She gave me a nasty look, and I started to wonder where my sweet girlfriend went. For a few weeks, she's been getting annoyed easier and always on her phone. It made me second guess everything I've done, wondering what set her off. We walked in silence. My phone buzzed. It was a text from Jason encouraging me. I smiled. Then my phone shut off. I frowned, trying to turn it back on. I wasn't too worried when it didn't boot up the right way. It looked like layers still worked in case we needed one. I put it back into my pocket to check over later. The way to the dead end was an easy one. Just straight until we hit the three forked path and take the left opening, then just keep walking. The other paths lead to more dead ends, but none as impressive as the one we were going towards. Leia let out a sound, and I guessed her phone started to have issues. That rock looks like a dagger, I pointed out, not knowing what to say, or how to start as we walked into the entranceway of the glittering room. Leia looked down at the rock, not looking very impressed. In fact, she hadn't looked impressed at all during the trip. I was trying to ask this girl to marry me today, and yet I was at a loss of how to bring it up. Before we arrived, I had this all planned out in my head, but now it was a blank. I want to leave, Leia said, a few moments after we arrived in the dead end of sparkling walls. I expected her to be impressed at least by a small amount. Even if you don't like rocks, the sight of the glimmering wall should be enough to move even the most stubborn of people to a positive emotion. My heart sank, and I was certain that I wasn't going to get the question that day. I needed to regroup and think of a different plan. All right, let's meet up with Tabby and Jason. My voice sounded small and defeated. I put a hand into my pocket, feeling the rim box, promising I would think of a better plan. It just needed more time, and I should relax. For whatever reason, today was just not my day. We walked down the same way we took to get to the dead end, and somehow got turned around. There was a spot where the path forked in three ways. We took the left one, to get into the inner dead end chamber and should have just walked right out back into the forked area and towards the path with the light. There was no path with light coming from it. I stayed on the left side thinking it felt right, only for us to loop back around to the forked path again. I gave a nervous laugh over my shoulder to a very unimpressed Leia. She tapped her foot and I decided on the right side. And we looped again. Checking my phone, I wanted to text Tabby asking her for a map but my phone refused to go past the lock screen. I assumed it was maybe something in the rocks messing with it. We already took the two side openings, so logic would say the middle would lead us out. We're never getting out of here, Leo whined. I didn't blame her for getting a bit annoyed and whiny. We had been trapped in the dark for at least half an hour now. I just didn't understand how it was possible. There were only a few forks in the path. One was bound to lead out. I was positive that the middle path was the way out, but now I wasn't so sure. As we rounded a corner, I saw the dagger-shaped park and my heart sank. The rocks glittered in my dim flashlight. We ended up where we started at the end of the path. See, I told you, Leah hissed, frustrated. She dug in a massive purse and pulled out a pack of cigarettes. She promised to quit. Now wasn't the time to remind her. I didn't care if she was still smoking, but I didn't think it was wise for her to light up inside the old mine. Who knows if there was old gas still inside? Wasn't that a major issue all mines had? Maybe you shouldn't smoke in here, I told her meekly. Give me one good reason, she replied sharply. I didn't have one. 
I suddenly felt on the spot for my lack of knowledge about mines. I only took her here because I thought it would be pretty. Feeling guilty for the whole situation we found ourselves in, I turned away from her. Looking over the shimmering wall, I started to second guess myself about how many paths this mine really had, and if it was possible I'd missed one in the dark. A sound from behind us made me tense up. I was just about to check my cell phone for the thousandth time and nearly dropped it when I heard soft footsteps coming down the tunnel. It wasn't layers, I could tell that much. I turned on my heel, shining a flashlight down the dark path, wondering what I would see. It sounds silly that I expected anything but a person. Being underground plays with your imagination. My beam of light landed on a boy. Blonde hair standing out in the dark, big blue eyes staring over at us. He was wearing flip-flops that was the source of the strange walking footsteps. His t-shirt looked at least five sizes too big for his frame. He couldn't be any older than 13, if that. Leia gave him a side eye and didn't acknowledge him. Hey little guy, what are you doing down here? I should have asked about the way out, but the moment I saw him, I was more worried about a child being alone. Mushroom collecting, he answered back in a small voice. I looked at him confused. He opened his hand to show off a mushroom that looked like the same texture of the rock glittering walls. Lifting his long shirt, he put the mushroom in a baggy side pocket of his shorts. What are you two doing down here? He asked, looking between us. Clearly we're having fun, Leia snapped. He dropped the last of a cigarette and stomped on it with her heel. I ignored her bad attitude and wished she would tone it down so she wouldn't scare the kid away. We got lost actually. Can you show us a way out please? I asked in a sweet tone, hoping it would counter layers. The boy gave it a long stare, then nodded. I thanked him, and we started to follow him down the path. I tried to take Leia's hand, but she pulled hers away, still angry over being lost. Why are we trusting a kid to get us out, she said, not even trying to whisper. Because he knows the way. It doesn't matter if he's a kid or not. All right, fine. Don't snap at me. I didn't think I raised my voice. She was stressed, so anything would feel like an attack. We all walked in silence as we went down the dark path. I started to hope that the way out was near when I felt some whiffs of fresh air against my face. Now that I was noticing them, I thought I saw some mushrooms camouflaged in with the rocks. I'd never seen mushrooms like that before and would ask about them when we got out. There's no way this kid is going to get us out, Lay muttered under her breath. This way. I just realised I never asked the boy his name. We turned a corner and I stood in shock, mouth open. Before us was a dead end I hadn't seen before. This didn't make any sense. We should have made it to the trail with the three pathways. I even walked up to the solid wall of rock, placing my hand against it to see if it was real. That doesn't make sense, I said finally. I told you he would get us lost. Lay was at the end of her rope. She walked off in a huff, digging out her smokes again and started to fiddle with her useless cell phone. I turned my attention to the boy who looked a bit too calm for being around two stressed out adults. What's your name? I asked him. I might not know the way out, but I could at least start with what information I could learn. He opened his mouth to answer, then shut it again. Clearly, he didn't trust strangers with his name. I didn't blame him. The poor thing must be scared of being trapped with us. How about a nickname? I'm Jamie. He fidgeted and debated on what name he should give me. Finally, he decided on one, blue eyes looking up at me, mostly hidden behind wavy blonde hair. Ian, he said in a small voice. That's a good name. I like it. We'll get you home, Ian. Don't worry. How about we head back and see if we somehow missed a pathway in the dark, I asked, and offered my hand. Holding a child's hand was just a normal reaction. I didn't even think about how it would make him feel more awkward around me. When I realised my mistake, I started to draw it back, but Ian took it before I did. He looked perfectly fine holding a stranger's hand. In fact, he seemed kind of excited and hiding it very poorly. Someone should talk to him about trusting strange men in caves. When we got him to his parents, I would mention it. Leia looked back at us, disgusted. We're not having one of those, so get used to it, she said harshly, and this took time the, the lead. At that moment, I really wondered what I'd ever seen in her. I chided myself for the thought. 
She was just stressed out and normally not like this. I gave Ian what I thought to be a comforting smile and we started to walk and walk. My phone clock kept glitching out and looping backwards, so I had no idea how long we walked for. Ian gave no complaints. I started to get worried. I only expected a short walk and brought no supplies. I suppose when people noticed us missing, this place would be swarming with rescue workers, but how long would that take? Didn't it only take three days without water to die? If my phone was working, I could look that up. Hell, if it was working, we'd be out of there by now. We came with some friends. They left before us, and they see we didn't come out. They'll send someone, I told Ian, trying to comfort him. As if. I bet those two just went right home and they're finished with dinner and in a nice warm bed by now. Leah snapped behind us, her voice echoing. Please, let's not do this right now. I was completely embarrassed over how she was acting. Shuffling Ian behind me, I didn't want him to hear her, but it was impossible in the small space. Do what? Fight? Because you have it coming. Why did you even bring me down to this shitty place? If you were going to go, why didn't you take me somewhat normal? In her rage, she took off one of her shoes and threw it at me. She missed. Her little temper tantrum was pathetic. Still, I was a little hurt by it. You knew? I asked for the ring box, feeling like a hundred pounds in my pocket. Duh, hand it over. I held out a hand, expecting. What? The ring, hand it over. I should at least get it after suffering through all of this. I felt a slight tug on the back of my shirt. I was peeking from behind me, staring at Leah, barely hiding the disgusted look that matched the one she'd given him earlier. I put a hand on his back, feeling a bit sorry that he was stuck hearing such a drama. I didn't bring the real one. I just have a fake cheap because the one I'd ordered didn't come in yet, I lied. She let out a huff of anger and started down the path again, now missing a shoe. She stopped a few feet away, just trying to get away from me. Ian gave me a hint of a smile. I think he was proud that I didn't give in to her demands. I picked up Leia's shoe and gave it a soft toss towards her. I could do that much. It was silently agreed to take a break. Leia was chain smoking through a pack up front, and me and Ian sat down against the hard stone wall. I'm sorry. He gave me a little shake of his head and rested his cheek on his knees. Staring down at where Leia was for a few seconds, he looked back over to me. Is that why you came down here? To ask her to marry you? Yes. But I swear she's never like this. I told him my face was flushing in the dark. Have you ever had any fights or gotten in trouble like this? He asked, and I didn't understand what he was getting at. Well, no. Then how do you know what she's like under stress? Guess it would be nice to be with someone and never have any issues. But if you do, then how are you going to deal with your partner going out of control when you never experienced it? How old was this kid? He looked a lot younger than the words he was saying. I thought his generation watched video games and not people dealing out relationship advice. Are you speaking of with experience from over there? I joked with him. He let out a small smile and his expression went back to the serious one again. It looked as if he was debating on telling me something. How do you think your two friends got out of here? He asked, still not taking his eyes off of where Leia was. They took the right path, I said, stating the obvious. You thought we were going the right way when I started to guide you. What changed your mind? His blue eyes shifted towards mine and I suddenly felt uncomfortable. There was a change in the air surrounding him in a way I just couldn't place. I couldn't meet his gaze and looked away, trying to remember what happened when we ran into the dead end. I don't, I said honestly. Everything that happened just got muddled in my head. Then pay attention to the next few minutes. Standing up, he waited for me to follow him. This all was strange. Until that point, I just thought we got lost naturally, but now it felt like other forces were at work. I was uneasy, but still wanted to trust the boy. I gave him a small nod and followed him. We're going to try looking for a way out again, I called down to Leia, only to get a very rude answer back. Just walk. She'll follow us or not. I almost felt bad for her. She swore at us and hurried after getting delayed to put her other shoe back on. We started walking again. This time, I felt as if Ian really did know the way out. But I didn't know what he was trying to prove or show us. With him leading the way, I yet again felt the slight breeze of fresh air and hope stirred. Only to have it come crashing down. 
I told you, he's just a kid. I bet he got us more lost in the first place. Leah's voice whined behind us. I turned to tell her off when I ran directly into a wall. I bounced off, landing on my backside painfully. Swearing I looked up to see a dead end, I should have noticed long before slamming into it. I heard Leah whining behind me, but I didn't even pay any attention to her. I dropped my trusty flashlight. It flickered, but kept lit. I picked it back up to look over the wall, wondering how it seemed to appear out of nowhere. Then to my horror, realised I didn't see Ian. This way. Shining my flashlight down the narrow pathway, I saw the boy behind Leia. That didn't add up. How did he get behind us so fast? She let out a small scream, noticing Ian in the dark. He took off disappearing, and I got up to follow him, Leia protesting behind me. We both fumbled along, quickening our pace and following his footsteps in the dark. And we kept running into dead ends. No matter which way we went, they all ended in rock walls. We didn't take a new pathway or turn. It was all in a strange line both ways. But we kept hitting the blocking walls at different paces. It was just guesswork because our phones both stopped working. One wall felt like five minutes of walking before we hit another. Then, we would turn to walk a few seconds before arriving at a wall that wasn't there before. Leia was complaining the entire time in near tears. She raged about me being the reason why we were stuck. I heard Ian's footsteps just beyond where my flashlight would reach. Finally, I needed to stop and slumped against the wall. Leia sobbing off somewhere close by. I was getting dehydrated. Doing this without water was taxing on my body. Small footsteps stopped in front of me and Dean appeared. He sat down, cheek on his knees, looking at me again. How do we get out? I asked him with a pleading tone in my voice. I can't tell you, right? I'm already late and someone is going to be worried about me, but I can give hints. I really didn't know who Ian was. He didn't even seem human at that point, but I was going to take any help I could get. I sat with a flashlight gripped in my hand. The small amount of light was the only comfort. How do you think your two friends got out? He asked again. I groaned, still not understanding. Because they took the right path, I answered. They took what they thought was the right path, he corrected me. I stared at him. It really couldn't be that simple. It just couldn't be. He looked down into the dark where Leia was crying and cursing to herself. And I was embarrassed it took me so long to clue in. We were trapped. Because Leia keeps saying we're going the wrong way. Ian rolled his head on his knees a little, making it hard to tell if he was agreeing with me or not. Sure, the first time he was showing us the way out, Leia doubted it. But it could just not be that simple. The world doesn't work like that. There are the right paths and the wrong paths. Dead ends don't just appear because one person thinks they're trapped. I'm not talking about the way out here. Let me make that clear. I'm not saving you. I'm just giving you an example of how things work. If someone has decided to be miserable, sometimes you cannot change their mind. They'll only burden you, dragging you down. Your friends walked out together. Are you and Leah together right now? Ian asked, sounding serious. Who thought being trapped inside an abandoned mine was the same as being trapped in a terrible relationship? I understood what he was getting at, but I just couldn't leave her. I can't leave her behind, I told him, my eyes cast downwards. Then you'll die. He didn't sugarcoat his words. Standing up, he looked down at me, waiting for a few seconds before starting to walk down the dark pathway away from us. His little flip-flops echoing in the darkness. Sitting, I listened to both his footsteps going towards us, what I knew now to be the way out, and lay as soft crying. She either didn't hear us or didn't care. If I left her, she might never get back out. I'd be leaving her to die. If I didn't, I would die here with her. She wouldn't have a second thought about leaving me behind. I knew that much. My decision was made only after I realised if one of us got out, we could send help to retrieve the one still lost. Getting up, I followed behind Ian. It was as simple as that. I expected to see the right paths out, and I was out. The setting sun blinded me as I walked out of the cave. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and my friends did in fact start heading to their car, and wanted to see if I was out yet, and needed a ride home. I frantically called them, 
saying Leah was still stuck inside. My entire body turned to ice when both of my friends had no idea who I was talking about. Awkwardly getting them off the line, I started to go through my photos to see none of Leia. No Facebook account, no message, nothing. She was not only missing, she was just gone. The ring is still in my pocket as the only proof she was real to at least one person. You got out, good for you. I looked over to my side and saw Ian standing a few weeks away from me. Because of the light of the sunset, his hair looked almost white and his blue eyes took on a reddish tint. After everything, I knew he wasn't human and yet I didn't know what he could possibly be. Is she gone forever? I asked. I did fall out of love with her inside that cave, but that didn't change the fact I loved her at some point. I didn't want her to just fade away like this. It's up to her. All she needs to do is walk forwards. Even if she does get out, you really shouldn't marry her. You're not a good match. I felt awful, but still let out a small chuckle at his honesty. I still had one more question for him. Why did you save me? At any point, Ian could have just left us behind. He gained nothing by getting me out of that cave. After my question, he fidgeted with the hem of his shirt and mumbled something I didn't hear. He finally looked and was acting his age. Any kind of intimidating air from him was gone. I didn't save you. You figured it out on your own. And don't hold someone's hand just after meeting them. They might get attached. Ian snapped, his face flushed in the red light. He didn't sound angry, just embarrassed. It took everything I had not to laugh at him. My eyes filled with tears, holding in snorts. The only reason why I was alive is because I treated Ian so kindly. For some reason, he must not have people offer to hold his hand often enough for it to be treated when it happened. And I didn't save you, he shouted, face still red, and gave a sharp point in my direction. He stomped one foot and started to huff away, knowing there was no way for him to regain his composure around you. Thank you for not saving me, I called after him. I only saw his back, but I think it made him even more embarrassed. Some time has passed since then. I never found out if Ian was his real name or what he was. I'm still very thankful he showed up when he did. I still go by the mine entrance waiting to see if Leia comes out. If she does, I'm not going to date her. But at least I'll still be around to support her and keep her life on track. It might be because I feel guilty. But I guess the reason doesn't matter. I was away from 1999. It felt like the entire world held their breath, waiting for the world to come crashing down because of a computer bug. I was convinced I was not going to live to see the new year and wished it was for the same reason the rest of the world was worrying about. On that night, I found myself in a dimly lit warehouse, tied to a chair, desperately trying to get out of the situation alive. My father was a no-good son of a bitch that brought down everyone who ever came into contact with. I was glad to be away from them the moment I was able. The only good thing he ever gave me was a bit of advice that kept me alive during my adult life. Doesn't matter if you have jack shit, you just need to convince people you have something they need. And that's exactly what I did. I conned people thinking I was the right person for the job. Faking skills to get paid until I either learned said skill, then got bored of the job and moved on. Or got caught and fired. Soon, I found myself not able to find respectable work that paid enough to keep me living. Slowly, I started doing more and more little jobs on the wrong side of the law. It was a creeping downward slide I didn't notice just how far down I'd gotten until I hit rock bottom. I was executing too many plans, too many promises to too many people. It only took one thing to slip up for me to land in boiling hot water and it finally happened. I was jumped while walking to a bar, beaten and blindfolded. The long trip was spent in the trunk of a car, unable to get free. I tried sweet-talking my captors, giving them more promises I swore I could keep until I was forced into a rough wooden chair and strapped down. The moment the blindfold came off, I knew I wasn't going to leave that building in one piece. I have many bosses, but the man before me was the toughest and meanest of the bunch. My sweet-talking skills may have gotten me the job at first, but was not good enough for the skill to get out of the mess I was in. I owed him money I didn't have. That was it. That was all the facts. 
I should accept it. I just couldn't. I needed to believe in a good outcome or else I really had no chance. No matter what I promised and said in my sweetest of tones, I was still worked over. I was alive, so I must have thought I had something of worth. I feared what would happen when they found out I had no girlfriends, no sisters I could sell out. No hidden money and just a crappy car to my name. I didn't even own my own fridge. If I ever moved out of my apartment, it would stay with my penny-pinching landlord. The only way they could make money off of me was to sell my organs. My blood type was a rare universal kind that meant anyone could use it for transfusions. In my darker times, I sold my blood to get by, and that's how I knew. I wondered if that meant my organs could be used by more people and therefore be worth more. I didn't want to find out. Boss, I keep telling you, I didn't lose your money, I just invested it. If you just give it till the end of the month, I'll get it back in triple. If you leave me tonight, you'll really be getting nothing. I said, as coolly as someone who was strapped to a chair, with a broken nose and a broken set of fingers could speak. That massive man of pure intimidating muscles did not look moved by my offer. Even with all the pain I was in, I felt annoyed. Are you going to kill me or not? Torturing me isn't going to get your money back, so just let me be done with it. I don't think he's worth the time. We should just feed him that thing and be done with it, one of the grunts said, looking at me in disgust. What thing? I knew the boss I made the foolish mistake of borrowing money from liked cats. Big cats. No one knew the number of illegal black market pets he owned. He liked them scattered through the country for safekeeping. Honestly, being eaten by a lion or a tiger was almost enough of a way to be killed. I almost didn't mind. Almost. The boss looked over at the man who suggested it, then back at me, deciding on my worth. It's triple, I stammered out, but deep down, I knew what my future held. Yeah, I'm done with him. Bring that thing in. Make sure there isn't a mess left behind, the boss said, giving a wave and walking away, completely ignoring me begging for him to just stay and listen. I was frantic, almost out of my mind from fear. I started talking to the two men who stayed behind while the third went off to get whatever beast that was about to make me a nice dinner. Come on, don't do this. I wasn't kidding about the money. If I can get this much in just a few days, just think of how much more I can get in the future. You don't need to work for the boss anymore. Think about it, right? In a few months, you can just retire somewhere nice and hot and the girls are dirt cheap. Isn't that the best idea you ever had? I kept chattering on, hoping that if I threw everything to the wall, something just might stick. When the other man came back dragging a creature on a chain, it shut me up. Nothing had ever shut me up in my entire life, but this did. I stared, body turned to ice and mouth open in mid-word at the monster that had been literally dragged into the light. It was double the size as the lion I expected to see, dark and strangely enough flickering. It walked on all fours, massive claws leaving deep tears in the solid concrete. The chains around its neck looked perfectly real and solid, but this thing kept going in and out of focus, like I was never meant to see it. As if those chains not only were dragging it along towards me, but also dragging it into our world. It fought hard against the chains that left a deep wound where they touched its skin. The beast let out a roar of protest, but that too sounded unreal and out of focus. It had a mane of dark fur that at some point must have been a proud feature of glossy black. Now, it was just matted and dull. A sheet was over the top of its head, leaving only a snout of jagged teeth exposed. Seeing the countless scars etched into the poor thing, I felt as if we were both in the same boat. Caught and tortured by these bastards. After seeing it, I was still afraid of whatever supernatural creature that had just been dragged in front of me. But I also felt sorry for it. I wanted to do something, anything to help it, even though I was not in the position to do so. Come on, you overrated mute, behave. We have a nice sack for you. Eat him and you can go back to your cage, the man grunted, trying to drag the thing even closer. With a jerk of its head, the beast tore the chain from the man's hands for a few seconds. The other two ran in and helped him get the monster under control. It shrieked in protest, just wanting to be free of them. One peeled away to grab my chair from behind to drag me closer. The chair legs made a horrible sound across the ground, like nails on a chalkboard. I tried making it difficult for him, 
but in the end couldn't do a damn thing as my chair was placed within reach of the dark monster. The monster stopped struggling when I got closer. It could smell my blood. I knew it. Its nose got right up close, nearly touching me as I felt hot puffs of air ruffle my hair. I expected it to smell horrible, but oddly enough, it smelled almost minty. It would only take one bite to end me. I really hoped that my head got taken first and not my legs to suffer through being eaten alive. Suddenly, the idea of being chomped down by some powerful animal didn't feel like a neat way to go at all. It just felt like the end. Drips of drool came from its mouth and dropped onto my jeans, soaking them through. It made my skin crawl. I tried backing up the chair, only to see a man was holding it in place. Come on now, eat him. That's an order. Those words made the monster tense. Before it just looked curious about me, but now it looked like a cat ready to pounce. It now had orders and needed to obey them. I was hoping that wet feeling was because it drooled on me, and not because I pissed myself seeing the sudden change. I was so out of my mind in fear, I didn't even stop and think what the hell this thing even was. A crushing force came down on each of my arms, strapped to the chair, as the beast placed huge claws on them to stand up. Those countless teeth just above my head and jaw, opening, ready to take one massive bite. In my last moments, I wanted to pray, but couldn't find any kind of thoughts in my head. I took a large inhale, waiting for death to come. To my shock, I didn't get my head torn off. Instead, the monster turned that deadly set of teeth on the man holding my chair from behind. The dark fur covered my vision. I only guessed he got his head bitten off instead of myself when screams of surprise and fear came from the other men. A flurry of motion started. The beast was dragged back, the claws digging into the flesh of my arms, leaving cuts, but also snapping the restraints keeping me down. My body moved before my mind did. My bleeding arms shot down trying to get my legs free as I kept darting my head up to see the other two men trying to get control of the monster. One pulled a gun from who knows where and started shooting. The monster took some hits but darted away so the one holding the chains received some friendly fire. The man collapsed and the dark creature was free. It thrashed slamming into wooden boxes surrounding us. Packing peanuts, coffee grounds, and what I guessed to be bundles of drugs poured out. I really didn't care. I just had to get the hell out of there. The straps on my legs felt nearly impossible to undo. Because of the noise, more people came rushing in trying to catch the monster. Soon, they knew it wasn't possible and started to shoot at it. The entire scene was chaos and I was trapped in the middle of it. The gunshots going off was deafening. I'm sure the monster was making noise of its own, but I couldn't hear anything beyond the gunfire ringing in my ear. Men were getting ripped apart while they tried shooting the creature down. Wooden crates exploded into pieces flying around, almost as dangerous as the bullets. It was a miracle I wasn't shot when I was just sitting out in the open trying to get free. Another miracle happened when I got my legs out of the straps and started to try and run off into a direction away from the bullets and the beast. My luck ended there. I started running on unsteady feet towards a tower of crates to hide behind. A man turned the corner into the fight, knocking me over. He was middle-aged, white hair and had no weapon. I was so pissed he kept me from escaping. I burned the image of his face into my mind as I fell. Then the beast came closer to me. It was only a few feet away, but that meant bullets in that direction. What came next? made it feel like everything just froze. I was glued to the ground, on my back, looking in the direction of the monster. The man with the white hair had his arm outstretched, a face in concern of worry, and the monster with its head turned to look at something that was just tossed towards it. I didn't hear the explosion from my ears already being shot. I felt the shockwave and my head hit against the concrete floor so hard it knocked me out. There was no way to know how long I was out few seconds or a few minutes. My ears rang and my body was so stiff. I couldn't move, so I just tried looking around to see what just happened. Debris from the small explosion was scattered around. The overhead light flickered, making it hard to see clearly. By how much my head hurt, I was thankful for the brief stints of darkness. In the small few seconds of light, I saw the white hair man go over to the creature, 
carefully removing the chains. The monster looked as bad as I felt. Both back legs had been torn off. Countless injuries and bullet holes marred the dark fur. Even as I was on the ground, unable to move my head and body and head pounding, I felt bad for that thing. Whatever it was, it didn't feel right. It was harmed so badly and most likely going to die. Don't move. I'll do what I can. I was shocked I heard the man's voice. I shouldn't have been able to hear anything so clearly after that gun battle and explosion. As much as I disliked him for knocking me over and causing me to get caught up in that shockwave, I had to admit, he sounded like a nice person. He sounded so worried as if he was talking to an old friend. Do not bother me with my king. This was my mistake. Wash your hands. That monster spoke. Tears came to my eyes. I couldn't stop them. That terrifying yet injured creature almost sounded like a hurt child trying to act brave. That man. He has taken life myself. Can you save him? That was strange. Was the beast talking about me? I tried sitting up to get a better look, but my body didn't move. The white hair men looked over in my direction. I could have sworn he clicked his tongue when he looked at me. No, he should already be dead. Humans cannot heal from vast injuries like that, unlike you. If we could just get some virgin blood or flesh to patch you up, then maybe. The man trailed off, sounding as if his hope for the dark creature was fading, when he saw just how badly it was hurt. I didn't want to think about what he just said about me, how I had less hope than the beast before me. Using every ounce of willpower I had, I looked down at myself, and he was right. I really should have been dead already. My legs twisted and broke, arm torn off, and chest full of bleeding, ragged holes. How in the hell was I still awake? I tore my eyes away from my broken body and looked over at the two in front of me. I really wasn't going to make it out alive, but I could still do something. I tried speaking, only to cough and nearly choke on my own blood. I couldn't speak. Maybe they could sense it, though. The embarrassing fact that after living a life of crime, I was still untouched in a sense. If they needed virgin blood, they could take mine. You can laugh at the idea of me being so old-fashioned, of saving myself for marriage. The thing I discovered about my life early on is almost everything is out of my control. I was never going to live an easy life born the way I was, into the family I was raised in. No matter how hard I tried, my type never got anywhere in life. It was all beyond my control. So I was so desperate trying to find things about myself that were entirely up to my own decisions. Not sleeping around was one of them. If you want it, take it, I thought, hoping they could hear me the same way I could hear them. I felt cold. My eyelids were fluttering shut no matter how hard I tried keeping them open. Damn, I wish I wasn't so damn cold at the end. That was it. I was going to die because I listened to my father's advice on life. He really never did leave me anything worthwhile, now did he? I let myself be overtaken by endless darkness, expecting to never wake up again. For some reason, I did wake up. I had to be dreaming. My body felt stiff, but whole. I didn't know where I was. I didn't recognize the room in the slightest. A hospital room would make sense, not a high-end penthouse bedroom. I didn't move for the longest time trying to understand what the hell happened. Did I dream the entire thing? That must be it. There was no way I could have survived those injuries, and yet it felt too real to just be a dream. Sitting up in the bed, I looked down to see I was dressed in very silky and very expensive sleepwear. I could save for a year and still not be able to afford these. Lifting the shirt up, I inspected my body for scars or medical treatments. A lamp was on the bedside the bed, giving me enough light to see by. Looking down, I didn't think this could be my body. I was never fat because I could never afford to eat, but I never had a six pack before. All right, it might not have been a six pack, but it was way more toned than what my skinny body was before. I stared at it, then noticed my nails, each long and pointed like those ugly things women pay to have. I had to see my face, just to make sure I was still myself. Stumbling out of bed, I slowly made my way over to the bathroom on the other side of the vast plush room. Flicking the light on, I gave myself a good look over. My face looked the same, just healthy as if I was getting the right amount of sleep and eating good meals. I've never looked like this. 
My hair was dyed a dark black instead of the mousy brown color I hated. And my eyes looked more golden than the brown that matched my hair in the past. Aside from the eye and hair color change, I looked about the same. A noise from inside the penthouse nearly made me scream. I jumped crashing into the sink behind me. I couldn't find a weapon. Whatever was going on, I had to get the hell out of here. Someone else was here and I didn't want to stay and find out who. Creeping along the place felt like a castle. I shuddered to think of how much just renting it for a month would cost. Even with all my efforts going into not being spotted, a man I recognized came peeking out from the kitchen as I tried to make it as far away from this place as I could. Mason, I made you coffee and I could order some food. Go sit down, the white haired man from before said to me. My knee jerk reaction was to book it. This man knew my real name, not the false ones I've been using for years. I wanted to tell him to stuff it and I was leaving. You really shouldn't leave. My voice spoke, but I wasn't in control of it, nor was I controlling my body when it obeyed the man and sat on a couch in the living area. On the inside, I was screaming all sorts of protest trying to make myself move. But on the outside, I was acting like a good little boy sitting and waiting. Finally, that man sat down, setting a tray with two cups with sugar and cream in front of us on a small polished wooden table. I could finally move, but needed answers. I stayed sitting. Who the hell are you and what's going on? I asked for a voice cracking from stress. Instead of being annoyed by my outburst, he just sat back on the couch looking cool and amused. I hated him at that moment. I think you know the answer to the first question, he said with a smile that got on my nerves. Sir, I have no idea what you're talking about. Wait, sir? I never call people sir. Not unless I was busting out the sweet talk. I didn't like this man in the slightest, so what did I give him an ounce of respect for? What year is it? He asked, and I frowned. 2000, I think. What does that have to do with anything? How time flies. The last time Fex encountered me, I was much different. Went by a horrible name too. It was a strange feeling. I somehow knew what he was talking about, and yet not at the same time. It was too damn frustrating. Leering, like glaring. That was your name before, but... How would I know that if I didn't know who you are? And who the hell is Fex? My head started to pound as if it felt like facts were shifting, getting shuffled in my mind. Fex is the beast you allow your body to possess. That's how you know of me. He didn't move, only gave me another smile trying to show off his handsome features while my body felt like it turned into ice. I shot up suddenly, feeling like something was behind me. What stared back at me was a creature in the warehouse. Instead of being on all fours, it stood like a human, sheet over its eyes but still looking down at me all the same. It was fully recovered, looking like a terrible beast, and yet held some kind of beauty that could make your lungs stop. I nearly fainted at the sight of it. Instead, I collapsed back into the chair, head between my knees as vague memories started to flood into my brain. The man beside me I knew to be important to be a king of some sort. The beast behind me loved that man and was completely loyal to him. I was about to die when that king asked me to give my body over to the beast. We would both live and benefit from the agreement. Wanting to keep living, I let them do what they wanted. Do you need a few minutes? No, I just, I just need a straightforward answer, I said, not raising my head. All right then, for who I am, I go by Silverman. I'm the king of all the creatures of the dark. I was able to try and save Fex from those humans, and you saw how that turned out. Sadly enough, if rules are being followed, there isn't much I can do. They knew enough of Fex's true name to capture and control him. I wanted to do more. Rules are rules, though. Silverman sounded a bit distant and paused for a few seconds to collect himself. Fex was about to die. He could have just eaten you and lived, but this beast is far too kind on humans. Instead, he let you take him into yourself. In a way, now you're a half-demon. I suppose that's a term for it. You shall not age. It's nearly impossible to kill you. Because half-breeds do not have true names. They do not have that weakness and cannot be killed or controlled by it. Fex only wanted to kill the humans who captured him. Now that it's done, 
He has nothing else to live for and gave up himself so that you may also live. I sat up, looking behind me, trying to see the monster that saved my life. He wasn't visible, but I felt like he was still there. He would always be there. Wait, when did he kill those people? And isn't there like a way to split us apart? Silverman gave my questions a wave of his hand as if I should know these answers already. No, once you two are together, you shall always be one. Fex has a stronger will of you two, so he can take control of your body at any point. Like I said, he's kind. He took over, killed the ones who wronged you, and took you back into a comfy bed. You should have no memory of this, as if you were asleep. Although it is possible to be aware of his actions while he's in control. Fex forced you asleep because he guessed you would not wish to see humans dying by your own hands. I felt sick with each passing word. My hands shook and I grasped them together, feeling as if they were no longer my own. I wanted to be angry at what happened, to have my body just taken from me like that. In the back of the mind, now I knew he was there. I felt Fex stress and worry about my reaction. Slowly, I forced all the tension out of my shoulders to accept what was being said. Yes, it was pretty alarming to hear my body was borrowed to commit murder, but Fex really did right by me, considering he could have left me to die. He only wanted this one thing. I should really just let him have it. Fex also relaxed wherever he was hiding in the back of my head. The whole thing was very, very strange and needed time to get adjusted to, but it was much better than the alternative. Now the issue is, you're wanted for murder. Drink your coffee. But what? I sputtered out. My body acted on its own. I knew that it was Fex talking over. He could not ignore any order from his king, so he took the mug and made me some drink some more. Fex did not have the forethought to cover up his crimes. After slaughtering an entire gang, you're on top of a few lists. But because you're now under my care, you shall not be arrested. I arranged a new identity for you. This place is just a temporary place to rest your head and get caught up. You'll need to be on the move, but I assure you, you shall not be caught for those murders. I still felt a little sick just from how much information I needed to go through. Murder wasn't right at all, but I thought about what they put Fex through. Yes, he was a monster. A creature that saved my life, and that's more than I could say about the people he killed. I was sitting trying to take everything in when Silverman got my attention. Normally, he was the type of person I would never get along with. Handsome, and he knew it. A killer smile that could seduce anyone he wanted, and I felt like he abused that power fairly often. But Fex liked him, and those feelings were rubbing off on me. I really didn't like giving this man any of my time. You see, you could just spend your new life travelling, but how boring do you think that would become? Wouldn't you like a job? Something important? I knew that kind of tone he was using. I'd used it most of my life. He was selling something, and the beast inside my mind was dead set on listening. Don't try selling me something. Just say it, I said. And Silverman let his mask drop a little. All right, I want to use you as a hitman. Sometimes there's only so much I can do, like with Fex. I should have been able to save him sooner, but my hands are tied in some situations. That wouldn't apply to you, because you're both human and not, and very hard to kill. You only need to let Fex take over to do the work, and you can enjoy the reward of being paid so much money you won't know what to do with. You'll live the easiest life by pretty much just sleeping through very profitable work. Also, this won't just, just benefit creatures of the night. How many humans do you think Fex had to harm based on orders he couldn't refuse? Humans and these creatures shouldn't mix. If you take my offer, you'll be doing a lot of good in this world. I sat and thought suddenly wondering what the hell I'd gotten myself into. I was wearing silk, sitting on a couch that would cost a fortune in a world so far removed from my own. Murder was horrible. Even when I was doing petty crimes, I swore I would never get to that point for money. And yet, it was a very good offer. I shouldn't turn my back on humans. Still, at the same time, my mind kept going back to the image of that dark creature torn and bloody. Against his will, he harmed people and fought against it. Fext kills the ones responsible, so they could never do it again. The real beast were the ones who caught him in the first place. What made me slowly start to nod my head was the idea of there being more Fexes out there. More creatures being used by evil for profit, and who knows what else. Alright, 
I said with a final nod. I felt even more sure of my choices as seconds passed. I'll take the job. Silverman was right. Time does fly. That night was so long ago, and so many things have happened since. I do have more stories to tell based on what my job brought, but for now, just how I became what I am. Some memories I don't want to bring back up just yet. Right now, I simply want to think about the worst, yet best night of my life.